on now to inheritance tax, give you a brief summary of the position. So inheritance tax is a tax which is payable by your estate after you've died. It will certainly be chargeable on your UK assets and depending on your situation, it might be chargeable on everything you own worldwide. Inheritance tax is triggered when assets are left to people who are called chargeable beneficiaries. And chargeable beneficiaries, it basically it's anyone who's not a spouse or a charity. So if you leave assets to children or siblings or friends, then you'll be leaving them to chargeable beneficiaries. And we've got to think about inheritance tax. Okay, so the basic position is this. Each person can leave up to £325,000 to chargeable beneficiaries without having to pay inheritance tax. Anything left over this is going to be taxed at 40%. So, to put a bit of flesh on this, imagine a single person leaving her entire estate worth £525,000 to her nieces. Nieces, chargeable beneficiaries. And so the inheritance tax regime will apply. The first 325,000 will be tax free, but the remaining 200,000 will be charged to tax at 40%. And this will leave the estate with a tax bill of £80,000 to pay before the nieces inherit. So if the position is a bit better, oh sorry, I'm coming to that. <laughs> the position is a be bit better for married couples. A spouse isn't a chargeable beneficiary, and so you can leave as much as you like to a husband or wife without any charge to tax. So you might have several million pounds. You can leave that several million pounds to your husband and wife, and there will be no tax to pay. Even better, because the spouse is not a chargeable beneficiary, you haven't used your nil rate band when you left all your estate to your spouse. The nil rate band isn't lost, when your spouse dies, his estate or her estate can claim your £325,000 and his £325,000 nil rate band. So married couples have a combined nil rate band between them of £650,000 worth of assets, which can be passed down to chargeable beneficiaries. Now, recent announcements from the government have made this position a little bit more complicated. But for many, many people, these complicated rules will work in their favour. The announcements are to do with a new scheme which is known as the Residential Nil Rate Land. And that is planned to be introduced in April 2017 and come fully into force in April 2020. So details of this Residential Nil Rate Land are still fairly few on the ground. But what we know so far is this. If you die and you leave a property, so you leave a house, to direct descendants, and that seems to be children, grandchildren, stepchildren, then you'll have an additional nil rate band from 2020 of £175,000 per person. So go back to the example we had before. If we've got our single person, and she dies in April 2020, with her estate, including a house, worth 525000 and she leaves it all to her nieces, her position won't change because nieces aren't direct descendants. But if she leaves it to her children, then she'll now have two nil rate bands to use. She'll have her nil rate band of 325,000 and she'll also have the 175,000 residential nil rate band. And that means that she can leave 500,000 pounds free of tax it will then be only the £25,000 which will be taxed and that will give her estate a tax bill of £10,000 which is much better than before. So now going back to that example I used before, imagine if the person I was talking about uh, wasn't a single person but was a widow whose husband had died before her and he'd left everything to her. Then her estate can claim her own nil rate band, her own residential nil rate band, and also reach back and claim her husband's nil rate band and her husband's residential nil rate band. And that 
gives her a total nil rate band of one million pounds, and she's only leaving 525,000, so that's all covered by the nil rate band, and there would be no tax to pay in those circumstances. So now I want to move on to reviewing an existing will. So if you've already got a will in place, that's great, but it's never advisable to forget about it. So we suggest that you review your will every three to five years. Changes happen both in your personal situation and in the law, and a will which was once appropriate might not be appropriate now. So, to give an example, Imagine a person who's been, who's been widowed and he makes a will leaving everything to his children. He then meets and marries a new wife and he's still committed to his children. He still wants to leave them everything and so he doesn't change his will. But if he doesn't have a look at it with an advisor, then his children are going to be in for a nasty surprise. When he married his new wife, his existing will was revoked by law because marriage revokes an existing will. As he hasn't made a new will since, he's going to die intestate, and the rules of, his, of intestacy will leave much of his estate to his new wife. So without intending to, he's disinherited his children. Another example relates to wills which were made for tax planning purposes a few years ago. The law on inheritance tax has changed a lot over the last decade, and wills which were a good idea 10 years ago can now actually be disadvantageous and that could result in a higher eventual tax bill. So the moral of the story is, once your will is written, don't put it away and forget about it. Every few years, get it out, check it, and if you've got any questions, then come and see me. Okay, I want to move on from wills now and talk about lasting powers of attorney. I've talked a lot about what's going to happen to your money after you die, but I want to move on to something that might be a more, far more important question. What will happen to you if you're still alive, but you've lost the ability to make your own decisions? This is called losing capacity in legal terms, and it causes a lot of problems. So for example, imagine that you own property and you've got some savings, and you then have a stroke, which affects your mind. You're extremely vulnerable at that point. You may be the most vulnerable you've ever been in your life. You need your savings to be spent on your own care, and you need them urgently, you need them straight away. But there's a problem, your savings are all safely in the bank account, but the only person who can operate that bank account is you, and you're in no, no state to do so. So this is a difficult and a real problem. If somebody else wants to help you at this point, then they can apply to court for an order to asset, access your assets, but it's a long and costly exercise. And it's not some, a position that anybody really wants to be in. The solution is to enter into a document called a lasting power of attorney for property and financial affairs. Now this is a document which allows you, which you enter into now, while you're mentally able, and you choose people that you trust to be able to access your bank accounts. And many people choose their children, but sometimes people choose friends or other relatives. And these appointed people will be able to take control of your affairs at any time you choose or when you lose capacity. They're not able to spend your money on themselves, but they're only on you and your care, and they have to act in your best interests at all times. So this means that if you find yourself in this vulnerable situation, your assets can be used for you at the time you need it most. If somebody raises a concern about the way that the attorney is behaving, uh, the, the Office of the Public Guardian will investigate. But you have no guarantee that that's, anybody is going to raise a concern. So you have to sort of step back a bit and make sure that you are appointing somebody that you've got 100% trust in. You know, not somebody that you think will probably be okay. You've got to trust people before you appoint them because you're giving them a lot of power. So you can I suggest giving, so long as you trust your children, then entering to a lasting power of attorney early is very sensible. I've got one. Um, so is my husband. It's easy for me because I can do it. Um, but it is you only have to do it once in your life uh, and it lasts forever unless you change your mind. Um, but so long as you trust your children then it's, a, it's sensible to put it in place as soon as possible. Um, you, you can do them yourself but they're, they're quite, they get quite complicated so um, people often get themselves into a terrible tangle which is why most people come to a solicitor. 
but um, it is possible if you uh, to do to do it without. It depends how brave you've been. Okay, so I want to move on to the other type of lasting power of attorney now. I've talked about the one for property and financial affairs. The other one deals with the decisions that need to be made if you lose capacity about your health and welfare. So it's similar in many ways in that you're choosing now the people who would make decisions on your behalf if you lose capacity, but it's decisions that are connected with your care. These decisions can be choices about where you live or how you're cared for, and it can, if you choose, include decisions about whether or not you should receive life-sustaining treatment. So many people find it a relief to know that if they lose capacity, the decisions about how they're cared for will be taken by the people they love rather than the medical team. So, for example, some people feel strongly that if they lose capacity, they wouldn't like to be treated just for any illness that comes along, but they'd simply be allowed, like to be allowed to die in as much comfort as possible. A lasting power of attorney for health and welfare would allow them to give these instructions to their attorneys, and their attorneys would then have the power to insist upon this if the situation arises. So that brings my talk to an end. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to take questions now, or I'll hang around for a bit, and if you want to come and speak to me individually, you're very, very free to do so. Thank you. Um, thank you.